Only in America. 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 This week, how refugees in Greece are contributing to the COVID-19 response in the U.S. You know, that's been powerful in so many ways to see these communities that have ultimately so little really stepping up, really stepping up for their brothers and sisters who they've never met. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Ali Nirani, and this is Only in America. Welcome back. Let's jump right into things. There's a lot to cover. June 20th was World Refugee Day, and this week we're talking about how refugees in Lesbos, Greece, are in fact helping churches in South Carolina. But first, some policy updates. You may have heard about the Trump administration's decision to extend and expand its proclamation from April that initially barred certain immigrants from the U.S. for 60 days. Now, the order has been extended through the end of the year and places additional restrictions on immigrants with certain visas. This extension and expansion is the latest in a slew of at least 48 immigration policy changes since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. To make sense of these changes, I want to bring into the conversation the Forum's Policy and Advocacy Associate, Danilo Zak. So first question for you, what exactly did the proclamation do? So the proclamation really does three things. First, effective immediately, it extends the immigration ban initially implemented in April, which suspended certain permanent immigration visa categories for those applying from outside the U.S. Those restrictions were projected to expire on June 23rd, and now they'll be extended to at least the end of the year. This is likely to have a really significant impact on family and diversity-based immigration in particular. Second, effective on June 24th, the proclamation expands on those restrictions, adding suspensions for several important temporary non-immigrant worker categories including high-skilled H-1B specialty occupation workers, H-2B non-agricultural guest workers, L visas for executives of multinational companies seeking to stay in their same role but moving to the U.S., and certain J visas for interns, trainees, teachers, au pairs, and others. And I should say that the families of these affected temporary workers will also be suspended from entry, which could pose really serious problems for a temporary worker who is here in the U.S. on an H-1B, for example, and is seeking to reunite with a spouse or a child who is currently abroad. And it's also important to note that this will only apply to those applying for new non-immigrant visas who are outside of the country on the day of enactment. There are also a number of exceptions to the order, including for certain healthcare workers involved in the COVID-19 response, food supply workers, and others. Now, the third thing the proclamation does is direct various federal agencies to issue directives, which could further restrict immigrants and immigration, including further restrictions on H-1B recipients and a rule preventing those who have given final orders of removal from receiving work authorization. So that could actually include many of those applying for protection under something called the Convention Against Torture. And these will take a while for the agencies to promulgate and publish, and their timeline and content remains unclear. So just to underscore a couple of things in that really, really helpful summary. First of all, this would not apply to whom? So this would not apply to a whole slew of non-immigrant visa categories that I haven't already mentioned. Um, including F-1 students, H-2A agricultural guest workers, and and certain other J visas, such as professors and other categories that weren't mentioned. And then there's also exemptions for uh, food supply workers, healthcare workers, and then there's national economic interest exemption as well for those who will be supportive of the economic recovery. And that's been left a little bit unclear how many it will affect or who it will affect. But For now, we know that there's a lot of exemptions and we're still trying to make sure we know who's going to be affected and who's not. Got it, got it, got it. So then ultimately, you know, at this point, based on what you read, either from the proclamation or otherwise, what does this mean for the economy? So the proclamation claims it is designed to protect the U.S. economy and U.S. workers during the current economic downturn. But the reality is this proclamation could really undermine the economic recovery and have really negative impacts on the economy. You know, I think the overwhelming evidence points to the fact that a healthy non-immigrant workforce spurs economic growth, raises wages for other workers, and creates new jobs for Americans that need them. And the particular programs targeted are especially important. Research shows that each additional H-2B worker, for example, creates an additional 4.6 jobs for U.S. workers. 
any H-1B visa represents a doctor, a civil engineer, a scientist. L visas are for high-level executives and CEOs. These workers really make for a more dynamic economy, and we want them here. And it just doesn't make sense economically to deny small businesses and other employers the workers they need just when they're trying to get back on their feet. So then why is the market a better arbiter of immigration flows than the government? Well, I think the first reason is that employers only use foreign worker programs when there are no other qualified workers available. And if you look at past periods with high unemployment rates and more Americans looking for work, data shows that the natural market response is to prioritize U.S. workers. And demand for certain temporary worker programs drops during those periods. Now, what this demonstrates is that the domestic workforce is already protected by the natural market forces, and bringing foreign workers is an often cumbersome process for employers, and they'll only choose to use these programs when no qualified domestic workers are available. But employers face critical workforce shortages even during economic downturns. And the tech sector, for instance, which employs many H-1B workers, currently has very low unemployment rate at 2.5% and many open positions. So especially as the economy begins to recover, these worker programs will be really necessary for businesses. As I already mentioned, government restrictions, such as the recent proclamation, are are too blunt an instrument. They will only slow down the recovery, which is why we should really let the market, which is much more flexible and responsive to the economy's needs, decide. And what you're getting at here is also the point that, you know, these programs as they existed required employers to do a market assessment, right? And they weren't just able to to kind of recruit foreign-born workers willy-nilly. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think all of these programs have numerous labor market tests that are called in place and other regulations ensuring that there's no adverse effect on the U.S. workforce. Um, you know, take the H-2B visa, for example. Employers are required to spend a significant amount of time actively seeking American workers to fill those open positions before they're ever allowed to even you know, enter in and petition for an H-2B position. So almost all these positions, it's already in regulation that they have to be there for only employers who are facing serious critical worker shortages. Got it. And where can people find more information if they're interested? You can find more information on the website at www.immigrationforum.org. And there's plenty more resources available there. Sounds very good. Hey, thank you so much, Danilo. And folks, we've seen hundreds of businesses, including Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Lyft, voice opposition to these restrictions on temporary workers and express concerns over a shortage of skilled employees. And last month, in fact, a group of Republican senators sent a letter to President Trump urging him to continue to allow these non-immigrants to come to the U.S. Advancing the false narrative that immigrants are competitors only serves to undermine the trust and unity needed to recover quickly and effectively from the pandemic and its economic effects. Banning certain types of legal immigration uses a national health emergency to further the administration's anti-immigrant objectives. The pandemic is the real enemy. Immigrants and immigration will help us win this fight. Like Danilo said, you can read more about the forum's response to the proclamation and our policy analysis at the website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. Stay tuned for a look at how refugees in Greece are contributing to the COVID-19 response in South Carolina. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security. And from Humanity United. When humanity is united, we can bring a powerful force for human dignity. My guest this week is Zoe Pappas-Schultz. She's the co-founder of When We Band Together, an organization that provides community centers and safe spaces for refugees. They want to ensure that people living through the difficult experience of being displaced have places to find safety, happiness, and purpose. Recently, they've been focusing on the Moria refugee camp in Lesbos, Greece, once called the worst refugee camp on earth by the BBC due to a history of violence, overcrowding, and unsanitary conditions. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, their organization and refugee volunteers created masks for all 20,000 residents of the camp. Then they continued to make more masks for people in need around the world, including churches in South Carolina. She told me about how these volunteers from some of the most marginalized places in the world are stepping up to help protect themselves and others amid the pandemic. 
So Zoe, thank you so much for joining the conversation today. I have really come to appreciate the work that you're doing, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So tell me a little about your story, because you have a pretty interesting kind of backstory of how you got involved in this work. Yeah, so we came into this work unexpectedly. Uh, it was fall of 2015, and my husband and I, my husband Alexander and I, we were traveling at the time, and we came. And uh, you know, here in America, we we didn't hear too much about the refugee crisis. We were like, you know, an ocean away, and we were in Europe at the time. It was omnipresent, and so we decided to fly over to the island of Lesbos. It's in Greece, and see how we can help and. At that time in 2015, it was the height of their crisis. It was a thousand plus people coming over every day from the coast of Turkey into this island via these, these rafts or really whatever boats that they can find. And we ended up staying a couple weeks on the island and our lives were just forever changed. So we knew when we left, we wanted to continue to find a way to stay connected, to find a way to continue to support. And so we started a small organization at the time, um, by making bracelets out of the life jackets that the refugees were wearing. There were just so many of them. And um, it just became, the life jacket just became a symbol for the crisis. And it was a tangible way to connect people, you know, our communities here in the United States and out West to this crisis that we were so underexposed about. And so we, we sold these bracelets to raise awareness and raise funds uh, to bring back to the island of Lesbos to support the local community and the refugees. What were some of the biggest kind of disconnects in your, your initial experiences? And what I mean here is like the disconnect between what you were reading in the States and then what you actually saw on the island. I think in the United States, you know, pretty broadly, the the term refugees is painted with a negative picture. Our, unfortunately, our people in power um, explain to us that you know, they're dangerous in some ways or that we don't have enough. And uh, so you just, because you're not exposed, naturally, that's that's what we believe, you know, because we want to believe our leaders in power. And when we went over there, you know, it's just so clear right off the bat that we have so many more similarities than we do differences. And these were just people, these were just families that were faced with the extremely challenging position that that their homes weren't safe anymore. So they were looking for a, a safe place to go. And is there a particular story or experience in those first days that, that sticks with you? Oh, man. Uh, when I tap back into that place, so much comes bubbling up. But I just remember standing on the shores, you know, and, and seeing those boats uh, come in and they had everyone from people in their elderly years of like, you know, 70s and 80s to brand new infants, to pregnant mothers, to children of all ages. And I just remember receiving the boats as soon as they would reach the shore and telling them you're safe, looking them in the eyes and telling them you're safe. Um, and it was like just this weight got lifted off of them. And, um, you know, the next question that they would follow up is like, where do I go next? You know, it's like they were on a mission. They wanted to be members of society. They wanted to start their lives again. So, you know, they were curious. They're like, I'm a teacher. I'm a doctor. Where can I work? Where can my child go to school? What can I do next? You know, wanting these answers. And so that, that was something so moving and truly transformative for me. So then how did you go from those experiences to this initial idea of kind of upcycling the, the life vest? Yeah, the original idea was, you know, it was just something that we thought of pretty quickly. Uh, at the time, I had just recently graduated college and I had taken a class where we used waste to create something meaningful. And that was just so aligned. You know, as you as you flew into the island of Lesbos at that time, you could see the whole rim of the island was covered in orange because that's how many life vests, that's how many people were coming in. Each life vest represented an individual. So we thought that we could use this waste that was covering the land as a way to really connect people to what was happening there. You know, if people could wear a tangible piece of someone's journey on their wrist, every day it could serve as a reminder. It was also, uh, like I said, a way to clean the land, a way to drive funds, raise awareness, and then support the local community, which was so, their tourist economy was so badly affected and we wanted to kind of cover as, as much as we could. So this was a 2015-16, right? Uh, yes. 
So what have the last few years looked like for the organization? But more importantly, how have you seen or have you seen the reality change in any positive way for you know, refugees who are still coming to the island? Um, so I'll, I'll speak to the situation for the refugees for a little bit first. In some ways, it's um, it's degressed. Uh, so at the time, you know, a lot of borders were open. So when they would come through the island, they would pass through pretty quickly, which was the goal. Nobody wants to stay on a small island in Greece where they can't work, where their children can't go to school, where they can't be participants of society. So the borders were open, people were flowing through, and now the situation has changed drastically. People went from spending just a few days on the island to now six months, a year, and not knowing if their journey will continue on or go back the way they came. So that's, that's challenging. Also at that time, you know, the refugee crisis was top of mind for a lot of people. It was a really popular story in the news cycle. And since then, it's kind of drifted off to be one of the many, unfortunately. So in a lot of ways, it, it hasn't gotten better. In terms of our organization, myself and my husband, we have learned so much over the years. We've grown so much. So starting as kind of that bracelet company to raise awareness and drive funds, and now have shifted to really trying to understand the situation as best as we could and continuing on that journey. And now we, our goal is uh, more so instead of smaller projects, we want to create safe spaces. We want to create positive places. So the day-to-day -day life of people stuck in these camps is a little bit better and a little bit more normal, if you will. Right. Because it seems like the island has moved from a transit point to you know a temporary shelter or a camp, like you're saying. Exactly. And it, you know, it wasn't ever intended for a long-term camp. So the resources there are so limited, like even the most basic resources are incredibly lacking. So just to give you some context, there's two main camps on the island of Lesbos. Uh, Karatepe is one of the smaller two, and then Moria is the larger. It's a former military base built for 2,500 people. And, you know, at times there's over 20,000. And even, like I said, the most basic necessities are lacking. So it's definitely a place that needs and deserves some more resources. So then kind of facing that reality, how did you develop a, a bit of a longer term approach to helping people through this phase? So our, our goals over the years have always been about providing projects and resources that were about dignity. So with the bracelet cell funds, we worked with Stavros Marianis, who was the Caretepe camp director at the time, and we created ID cards for everyone. So instead of everyone being a number, you know, now they were their picture and a name. We built barbecue pits so people can cook their own food. We installed Wi-Fi so people could stay connected with their loved ones around the world or back home. You know, so that was always near and dear to our hearts of like, really, what do the people need? Not what, what do we think they need? Like, what do they want to make them feel normal again, you know? So over the years, as that's kind of been in our in our heart space, we stayed in contact with our, our great friend. His name is Salam al -Din. He's a wonderful activist for the island, and he created a place called the Hope and Peace Center, which is a women and children's safe space directly across from Mori Refugee Camp. It's really hard to change things within the camp, but outside of the camp, it's kind of free range. So he converted this old warehouse into this wonderful play space for children, and it was just this, I mean, you couldn't walk in and not feel hopeful. You couldn't walk in and not feel happy. And this, this like turned a big light on for us. It's like, there's so much land around the camp and all it takes is a little bit of resources to help so much. So that became our mission with when we band together is just to, you know, band together to partner with other organizations on the island to uplift their work and create spaces around the camp intended to better the lives of the people within the camp. So then COVID-19 hits. Tell me what that not just looks like, but what that feels like for the community? You know, I think like everyone around the world, it still is an incredibly like, scary and unknown time. I think on a good day within uh, the refugee community, resources are extremely limited. And I think that was really clear to them. So um, our partner who I just mentioned, Salam al -Din, and his team of refugee volunteers, his organization is called Teen Humanity, they mobilized by making masks and raising funds to provide a mask and enough sanitizer for everyone in the camp. I think it was pretty clear to them that it was up to them to really start taking care of their communities. 
And what do they look like? I mean, what, what were the, some of the initial challenges? So the, the team was actually able to mobilize really quickly. And some of the initial challenges, like always, are just a lack of resources. So our When We Ran Together community had donated some sewing machines in the past, but they needed more. You know, if they were going to cover the 20,000 people within Moria, they needed more. They needed more machines. They needed more masks. And these were people willing to step up and they wanted to help. They wanted to create these masks. They just needed some resources. So once some other organization got word and got involved, more donations started coming in for more machines. And they were able to be making hundreds, if not a thousand masks a day. And in the end, was able to make enough masks for everyone in Moria, as well as parts of the local community of Lesbos, as well as other camps throughout Greece, and then organizations here in the United States as well. Tell me, what has it been like to say, you know, these masks were made by refugees and they are shipping them to the U.S.? Oh, man, that's just... um... You know, that's been powerful in so many ways to see these communities that have ultimately so little really stepping up, really stepping up for their brothers and sisters who they've never met, really stepping up for these. You know, a lot of the spaces that we donated in the United States were marginalized communities that didn't have access to this protective gear. You know, our our government wasn't taking charge and showing leadership of how to protect yourself during this crisis. And Then it became clear we needed to get masks, but nobody knew how or where. And it was just really, really beautiful to make those connections. You know, we we donated to Black Lives Matter, Greater New York, um, Dignity and Power Now, and uh, just some some really wonderful organizations here in the United States doing incredible work that just didn't have access. So it was really great to to be that bridge, to be that connection to, to help across borders. So there are masks arriving in South Carolina. Why South Carolina? So I've realized even just being in this space that, you know, us as humans, we only know what we're exposed to. So unfortunately, a lot of what people in our society uh, are told about refugees is is incorrect, in my opinion. You know, we're we're told from people of leadership that we don't have enough and that these people are maybe dangerous or here to take something. And that couldn't be farther from the truth from what I learned. And What our intention was with these masks is just to show that these are people who you would want as your neighbors. These are wonderful people who have so much to contribute to society, so much, you know, that we can learn from. And when they offered to keep creating and send some masks, we thought it'd be a perfect opportunity to connect. So the folks who are making the masks in in Lesbos these days, by and large, where are they from? Mostly from Afghanistan. You know, it's, it's changed quite a bit over the years, but currently most people are coming from Afghanistan. So describe for me what you think the conversation would be between the refugee from Afghanistan who has made this mask and the congregant in South Carolina who has just received this mask. In your mind's eye, what does that conversation look like? I think, you know, if you put two people in front of each other, they'd find more in common than they did different if given you know, the neutral platform to do so. And everyone around the world was experiencing, you know, this crisis. We all kind of, of course, had uh, experienced it in slightly different ways, but there was all the fear and the unknown, what still resides. And I think if a refugee is currently in Lesbos and someone in South Carolina were to be in a room together, they, it could be something really, really positive and beautiful. I think that connection is worthwhile and truly transformative. The reason I'm pushing on this a little bit, if you don't mind, is like, there's so much of the the migration debate that is defined by Mm -hmm. fear, and particularly fear as when it comes to security, whether it's one's health, their economic security, their their physical security. And just the, the power of a mask at this moment in time, is it the refugee community in Lesbos saying to South Carolina, we are going to help keep you safe? in terms of you and your family's health. And that to me just seems so incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, so yeah, I totally agree. The folks in South Carolina are going to be receiving these masks. What do you want them to remember? Look, I think I would love them to understand that, that these people are good, that it's easy to become consumed by fear and politics, but to realize that these are good people and and they stepped up in, in a time of need. And, you know, if given the opportunity, they would be an incredible neighbors and that our country has enough to, 
you know, to take in more people than we think. So what's ahead for when we band together? We just recently put up a treatment and isolation COVID clinic with MSF, Doctors Without Borders. It was a warehouse we rented in January in hopes to build another community center. And as COVID quickly hit, we realized we had to pivot a little bit. So partnering with MSF in the last, sheesh, 12 weeks or so, this warehouse has been completely converted into this hospital. And in the near future, you know, we have dreams to continue building out around the camp. We're in conversations to build a sports and a wellness gym, a mental health facility, an education center. So it's just really about coming together with other people on the island, other people who want to get involved. You know, it's all it's all about exposure. So it's like once that door is open, you know, we have the opportunity to really like step in and step up. And really like what I can take away from this experience is just that we have so much to learn from each other when we come together and just to see it as an opportunity. When you first started sending masks to the U.S., what was the reaction among the community in, in Lesbos, the people who are making the, the masks? Yeah, they, they were, I mean, ultimately the, the communities that we were working with, they were so grateful to help. They, I think, you know, obviously they know what it's like to be in hard times. They know what it's like to not have the resources that they need. I think it was just a show of solidarity, like, hey, I'm, I'm with you. I understand what it's like to be in a scary time and... When I can, I, I want to step up and help. And where can people learn more information about when we band together? We're at www.bt.org. And uh, yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you. We love growing our community and um, it would be great. Thank you. And my last question for you is uh, just to finish a sentence. It's a question I ask of everybody. Mm -hmm. And the sentence is only in America, dot, dot, dot. To be perfectly honest, yeah, I'm just so hung up and only in America and I'm feeling so down on America right now. Um, uh, only in America. Can we confidently say that our diversity is our strength? Zoe Pappas Schultz is the co-founder of When We Band Together. You can find more information about Zoe at our website, immigrationforum.org slash podcast. And next week, tune in as we hear from the South Carolina churches who received the masks from refugees for their congregations. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Only in America on Apple Podcasts and please share it with a friend. Only in America is produced and edited by Joanna Taylor, Megan Wetmore, and Becca Wall. Our artwork and graphics are designed by Carla Leja. I'm Ali Nirani, and I will talk to you next week.